everyone. Good evening. Yeah, point to him, would you? All right. <laughs> you got my attention. Sunday Sunday evenings, we take a few minutes to share about the ministry, so uh, all you lucky people from the other churches, you get to hear about this too. But Rock Solid Ministries is a revival ministry. As I mentioned this morning, we began our 20th year on the road uh, back in June, and we are an associated ministry with Mid-South Christian College in Memphis, Tennessee. The only one of our Bible colleges and our brotherhood in this country that offers every course in Spanish and English. And I think that's quite an accomplishment for a very small school. And uh, you can find out more about them by just going to the bottom of any page of our website. And our website is on all of our materials out in the foyer. In all of this time, we have never asked for an offering from any church. We've never asked anyone to support us, any church or individual to support us. We began with one family that put us on the road 20 years ago. But then after a while, so many people wanted to be a part of it, we allowed others to give to it. And now uh, we have about 20 families and these partner churches. We're getting a, we're ready for the partner churches. Best doing two or three different jobs for me back there. These churches from around the country uh, keep us on the road with regular support. And we always like to acknowledge them and, and uh, we appreciate what they do to keep us going. And that's why we, we do everything we do is free. Everything, our materials. We've given out hundreds of thousands of pieces of printed materials all over the country, places we've never even been. All of it is absolutely free. This is our mission statement. Rock Solid Ministries exist to revive the church in North America. Our mission will be accomplished primarily by the ministry of the Word in preaching and teaching and music in any and all ways afforded us. Now that music is our associate evangelist and his wife, not Beth and me. We want, we want a crowd so we don't sing, okay? But anyway, uh, if you want to know our basic values and beliefs, pick up a book like this right here and open it up and thumb through it and read it and you'll find our basic values and beliefs. But if you're one of those nitpicky people who just wants to know a little bit more, you can go to our website and, find, and click on the basic values and beliefs and you can find those answers I know that you want to know and, and that you should know about our ministry. This is our team. Of course, you know Beth and I, and Greg and Lori joined our team back in 2015. They travel full-time. Um, they're in West Virginia this week, holding a revival. And then Kristen, uh, the redhead there on the right, she runs our office. Now we've moved her office to the, uh, to the Oak Ridge Christian Church in Tupelo, Mississippi. She drives about 20 miles from where she's at to have her office there, but we're glad that she's there. Her husband is a student minister, and right now he's working at another job in between jobs as student ministers, so we're happy to have them working with us. Since 2004, we have held 673 revivals in 30 states and four Canadian provinces. We've had over, I didn't change that, it should be over 5,000 public decisions. There's people actually walking down the aisle during the revivals. We've had several thousand other ones that we just can't keep up with decisions during the week and uh, during the revival. We have over 200 revivals already scheduled ahead of us. Brother Greg, our associate, his and his wife's schedule is full through 2026. Beth and I are full through 27, and we're booking in 2028 right now. And again, as I've always told you, we're not that good. Our price is just right. <laughs> you know, we're free. So anyway, uh, also I might say that we're booking less revivals for Beth and I. In 2027, I'll be 70 years old, and we're just trying to adjust and figure this out. Uh, I will book as many as I always did if I get there and can. But So we're, we're going to have some openings. Next year we may actually have some openings. If we have what I like to call the election variant of COVID shows up next year, can Canada may close their borders again. And if that happens, I'll have about six or seven revivals open, dates open up next year because that's happened to us several times. So... Uh, anyway, but we're booked up like that. Uh, if you'll go to our website, click on the media tab. These are some things you can find there. Two daily devotionals, one book, one audio, and two PDFs written by us and our team. New Testament reading plan that you'll also find out here in the foyer. An annual newsletter. Um, actually, the annual newsletter is not on there right now. Uh, three social media links, True Social, Telegram, and Facebook. We have a hundred and now 
almost 180 audio podcasts and over 30, 30 videos up there. So uh, check those out if you would. Uh, we're on YouTube and Rumble. Anybody know what Rumble is? It's like YouTube, but they don't cancel conservatives. So everything we have on YouTube is also on Rumble in case YouTube says we don't like what you're saying. We're up on both. I kind of like the look of Rumble anyway, a little bit better. Greg and I have done some some online conversations uh, live, and uh, again, we haven't done any new videos in a while, but those are up there for you. Greg's done a, so several studies on there as well as a leadership conference uh, that he did on there. Also, uh, if you, does anybody here listen to podcast? Anybody? See some hands? Good. I can see some hands up. If you do, you recognize a lot of these. We're on all these podcast engines. We originate on Podbean, but we're on Apple and, and iHeartRadio and Google. You can just Google us, the RSM podcast, and we've been downloaded on every continent in the, on the world except Antarctica, and I'm going to work at getting to those scientists one way or another. But anyway, uh, we encourage you to check us out there. One of our more famous podcasts that we did was this fellow right here, Michael Grigsby. I don't know if you ever heard of him, but uh, we did him a couple of years ago, and we do a lot of interviews. We have radio messages from the 1960s from Fred Huckleberry, a very well-known evangelist back in that time. Uh, just a lot of things. Several ministers' wives are on there, including your minister's wife is going to be on there in January, Lord willing, because we're going to interview her this week. And uh, hold hers till about January, so we encourage you to check that out. Free stuff out here in the back. Oh no, no! If you, you can, if you have a, a iPhone, you can catch that QR code, and that'll take you to everything we have. But we also have some some uh, cards out there where you can get QR codes, and and uh, also one on your bulletin board. Now I believe the preacher put up there, and go to any of our sites. Free out in the foyer. We have upper left-hand corner is a Plan of Salvation Bible sticker. Just peel off the back, put it in your Bible. Always have an answer when you're talking to people about the Plan of Salvation. We also have that in track form in Spanish and English. And that New Testament reading program is in the upper right-hand corner there. That's also online, and it corresponds with our free iBook devotional, daily devotional that you can get. Uh, also, we have CDs of this morning's and tonight's sermons. We also have those on flash drive. If you prefer that and you're going to be here all week, just let me know. I'll have enough for you on Wednesday. If you can't get back this week, I understand, but you'd like to have them. I've got a couple of them in my pocket tonight. I'd be glad for you to have them. Everything is free. Just ask us for it. We want you to have it. We also want you to know that anything that we do receive, we don't believe we should keep it all. We just don't think that's right. Even though we don't ask for funds, we give 10% to a scholarship fund at Mid-South Christian College that goes primarily to students from the Americas that are coming up here, being trained, going back to Central and South America. Some are starting churches here uh, because Spanish uh, language, and we think that's a good thing. We're seeing some good things happen there. We're also giving 5%, so a total of 15%, to the Atlas Uriah Fund. And I think when I was here last year, it was shortly after our partner and his wife lost their almost three-year-old grandson in a tragic accident. His name was Atlas Uriah, and they started a fund that is only for men going into ministry, scholarship fund, go to preaching school, go to Bible college, young, old, they don't care. We have two they are already getting a scholarship, and uh, it's a good thing. Also, another thing the Atlas Uriah Fund is doing is, is we ha have the Enduring Light Preaching Camp, for boys 13 to 19 years old, we've had two years of it. They come in for three or four days, intense learning hom ho hermeneutics, homiletics, uh, just everything. And then they present their first sermons to a full house in a church in the Memphis area. And it was a great camp this year. And those sermons are on our podcast as well, if you look back a ways. And I encourage you to check those out. It's called the Enduring Light, because Atlas Uriah means Enduring Light. So pray for that. We need preachers. Can I hear an amen? amen. And we got it. we're trying to fill the pipeline with new preachers, getting them in there while they're young. Okay, uh, and this is where we're going this year, or where we've been mostly. Uh, the and the red ones are the Stricklands and us together. 
and uh, where they do the music. We preach. Beth also spoke in Wyoming this year to a ladies' group. And that's our travel schedule. Almost done. I got two more revivals after this one, and then we start all over again next year. We appreciate your prayers. That's the one thing we ask for you from you. Please pray for us while we're out there sharing the gospel. And pray for our health and for our travels, because we travel thirty to 40,000 miles a year, and we drive all of it. We're preaching about Elisha this week. <clears throat> Tomorrow night's message, where did it fall? Tuesday night is open your eyes. Open your eyes. If you're frightened, if you're scared of what's happening around you, open your eyes. Come and find out what that's about on Tuesday night. And the last night, to die like Elisha. To die like Elisha. Come and let's learn about that. You can see what tonight's message is. Let's begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to be here and to share with this group of people from your word tonight. Father, I do pray that it is your word, your truth that we hear, because my words can't change anybody, and we need change. Every one of us has an area of our life where change is needed, and I just pray that you'll take these words tonight and send them into each individual heart and bring about the change that is needed. Some will need to make the change where they stand tonight, where they sit. Others may need to step forward and make a, a visible change, a, a, a different direction in their life. Uh, like so many did this morning, making commitments to uh, change and getting rid of some things in their life they need to get rid of. Father, tonight we pray for that. I pray that you'll touch my tongue and my lips, that your word will go forth into our waiting hearts. And Father, we just thank you and praise you for hearing this prayer and answering it according to your will right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Elijah had followed God's direction in calling Elisha to replace himself. That's what the message was about this morning. Elisha served God and Elijah faithfully. And Elijah's time on earth was now just about done. We just, just scooted right through that time, right after he burned his plow and, and roasted his cow. Now we're already at the end of Elijah's time on earth. Elijah's time was just about done. Our text tonight is going to tell us uh, of their final days together and Elisha's promotion to what we might call, and I, I hate to use this term, but in today's church vernacular, we'll call him the lead prophet. And he's moving up to that position, and that's where this is going to take us tonight, and uh, a position that Elisha held for about 50 years. Let's turn to 2 Kings tonight, chapter 2, pretty long passage here. Verses 1 through 15. <clears throat> now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said, Do you know? that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord sent, has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he answered, yes, I know. I know it. Keep quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his, took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water, and the water was parted to one side and to the other, till the two of them could go over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what, you shall, what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, You've asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you, but if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they still went on, 
and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. And he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak of Elijah <clears throat> that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, the water was parted to one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. Now, when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho saw him opposite them, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. The three things that we learn from Elisha's example in this passage help us understand why he was so good at what he did. And why, as Christians, we need to follow his example in life and ministry. Like Elisha, we must be committed to our cause. I think repetition is a good thing. We learn things better that way. So we're going to go back and we're going to take a look again at verses 2, 4, and 6. Verse 2, And Elijah said to Elisha, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So he went down to Bethel. Verse 4, Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Verse 6, Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan, but he said, As the Lord lives, as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Every time in these verses, when Elijah says, Stay here, Elisha replies, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. Elisha had made a commitment years before when he burned his plow and roasted his cow that he would follow God and serve Elijah, and he wasn't going to stop now. Now, we don't really know the reason Elijah kept telling him, stay here. I mean, I don't know why he'd do that, but it was possibly to test Elisha's resolve. After all his years of service to Elijah, would he stay with him for the last mile of the way? Which is a question for all of us here tonight, isn't it? doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for a long time or a short period. How committed are you to the cause of Christ? How committed do you are, are to you to Jesus Christ? Times, they are a change in this old world. Isn't that right? They're changing like every day they're changing. But the narrow way is still narrow. And few there be that find it. And that has not changed. When asked tonight, are you committed to following Jesus Christ to the very end of your days, to your very last breath, even if it is the reason for your last breath? And years ago, as a preacher, I never would have mentioned that in an American church, but I'm saying that now. Know that it might not be the reason for our they are changing and we don't need to wait until that time comes if it comes to say well what am I going to do now we need to make that commitment now that we are going to commit ourselves totally to Jesus Christ are you willing to put God before government what price are you willing to pay to be a disciple of Jesus Christ well some people say Tommy it used to be a whole lot easier in this country Used to be a lot easier, boy. People used to be happy when you're a Christian. If they were, even if they weren't Christians, they were happy you were a Christian because you were a better neighbor, better friend. Times are changing. Yeah, it used to be easier in our country, but that was the promise of man, not God. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. 
Men's promises are short-lived, aren't they? Yeah. But God's word is eternal. Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. How committed are you to the cause of Christ? We need to make up our mind even now. We may be, we must be committed to our cause and passionate about our position. Elisha is first mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 19. And Jehu the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha the son of Shaphat of Abel Mahola, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. We read that this morning. And after three verses that describe his call, we hear nothing more about his ministry until Elijah is leaving the scene. And the only hint we get of his ministry is the end of verse 21. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. Now this was to be his place, his position for the next six to ten years. He was the lesser known servant to a well known prophet. In fact, even after he became the lead prophet, he was referred to as Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. Now how would you like that? Elijah's gone, you've been his servant, now you're the lead prophet, and you've done miraculous things. People say, well, that was great, Elisha. Hey, I know you. You used to wash Elijah's hands. How would you like that? He didn't seem to mind. He was passionate about his position as an underling servant, servant to the Lord because that is what God had called him to be at that time in his life. How passionate are you about where you're at serving the Lord? Leonard Bernstein, the late conductor of the New York Philharmonic Orchestra, was once asked to name the most difficult instrument to play. And without hesitation, he said, the second fiddle. He said, I can get plenty of first violinists, but to find someone who will play second fiddle with enthusiasm, well, that's a problem. And if we have no second fiddle, there's no harmony. Elisha was a servant to Elijah. He was passionate about his position and therefore brought harmony to his ministry. You know, it, it, it's sad the number of Christians, of Christians I've seen in almost five decades of preaching who would do anything to topple the man who speaks from the stage on Sunday morning or the well-known, well-loved Bible teacher or the wonderful choir leader or worship uh, team leader or whatever it might be. They, they want the prestige. The, they, they want the acknowledgments, but they have no understanding of the commitment to God to personal time, to study, to people that it takes to serve in that position. And they have no idea that really it's not that fancy of a place to be, folks. It can be a very difficult place to be, to be the minister in a growing church, to be the choir director, or to be uh, the well-loved son teacher. There are a lot of hours, extra hours that are put in, but all they see is the perceived accolades. In the mid-1970s, I was converted to Jesus Christ in Corinth, Mississippi, while visiting my grandparents. And that's where we live now, in northeast Mississippi. And there's an old theater there that's on the historic places in America called the Coliseum Theater. And they used to have a lot of quartets that came and sang there because that's just the center for quartet singing. They just, the crossroads for it, they're always there. And I went to hear, as a young Christian, 17 years old, I, I went, because that's the only kind of Christian music we had back then, so I went to hear a quartet, uh, one that, I don't know if you've heard of, of this gospel group. They were called the Oak Ridge Boys. And <clears throat> I went to hear them, and they sang a song called Rhythm Guitar. Have you ever heard that song? Wow. Maybe, maybe one person maybe thinks they have. Go home and Google it and listen to the whole thing. But, but here, here's some of the lyrics. A preacher I once talked to in Washington, D.C., he told me preaching the gospel isn't all that it should be. I said it didn't really surprise me, but I've often wondered why 
I'll never forget the words he said or the look that was in his eye. He said, nobody wants to play rhythm guitar behind Jesus. It seems that everybody wants to be the lead singer in the band. It's hard to get a beat on what's divine when everybody's pushing by the head of the line. It seems it isn't working out at all the way he planned. When nobody wants to play rhythm guitar behind Jesus, everybody wants to be the lead singer in the band. Shortly after this hit, the Oak Ridge Boys left gospel music for the fame and fortune of country music. Apparently, even they didn't like playing rhythm guitar behind Jesus. Jesus said, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mark 10, 43 to 45. Are you passionate about your place of service? No matter what that might be, whether it's preaching or it's teaching or it's mowing the church yard or cleaning the church building or preparing the communion or whatever it might be that you do, whether it's in front of the people or behind the scenes, are you passionate about serving Christ where He has put you to serve? Are you teaching the kindergartners with passion? Are you love to share with them what you have? Just, just for the opportunity to serve the Master. Will you take your seat in this great orchestra known as the church, the body of Christ, pick up your violin and play second fiddle for all your worth is what I'm saying. Will you volunteer to play rhythm guitar behind Jesus for the rest of your life? That's where he wants you. And he, Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might preeminent, be preeminent, Colossians 1, 18. He is the head, not me, not you. Let's be passionate about where he has put us at this time in our lives. Like Elisha, <clears throat> we must be committed to our cause, passionate about our position, and expectant in our calculations. Looking back to verse 14, Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. Elisha took his course of action with high expectations. When he picked up the mantle, he knew he had the power of God. And I can, I can just almost see this. Because you see, they're walking along, and it says that these chariots and horses of fire come down out of heaven. And they separate. They come between Elijah and Elisha. They separate them. And can you imagine the noise that the flames you know, just think of a roaring fire, and you've got all these chariots that are on fire. Then you've got the horses breathing, and the, maybe the whips cracking as they come down, and they swoop in between them. And then the whirlwind, you all know what that's like out here, I know. And it's coming along making that train noise, you know. And, it's, and, and it takes up Elijah, and it's all this noise that goes up, and then Elijah calls out after him, and then it's silent. And as he looks up there, he sees the mantle of Elijah falling back to the ground. Whether it came off or Elijah said, I'm going to throw this back for Elijah. But he reached down and he picked it up. And when he picked it up, he knew he had the power of God. When he struck the water, he expected nothing less than the parting of the water. When the young prophets saw the waters part, they knew Elisha was on a mission from God. Let me tell you something church when you pick up God's word you should always expect God to work always expect God to work why in the world we read the Bible or we teach the Bible and we don't think something's going to happen Hebrews 4 12 says for the word of God is living and active sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart when you teach listen to me teachers when you teach you're not sharing from a storybook. You're not just imparting information. You are sharing the breath of God with your students. All Scripture 
is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3.16 Expect change lives in those that you instruct. Every time, I don't care if you're teaching kindergartners, expect that God's Word is doing work. I'll never forget as a young Christian attending a young adult class, and this teacher every Sunday if he hadn't done it by the time that first bell, remember when they used to ring the first bell and the second bell? You know, some of y'all remember that. When that first bell rang, if he hadn't done it already, that teacher stopped, said something more about what he'd done, how that related to our personal lives, and he gave an invitation in the Sunday school class. Was there anybody in that class that needed to give their life to Christ? Take care of it right here. We'll baptize you upstairs when we get up to the, to the auditorium. Any of y'all need to rededicate your life? He believed that lives were being changed every time he taught the Bible. And we need to believe that as well. And when you preach the Word, and I know that some of you men take a turn from time to time you preach the Word. I know we got some preachers in here too. Let me tell you something. You're not doing it to add to the intellect of your listeners. You're doing it to affect change. Romans 10, 14 says, How then will they call on him? in whom they have not believed, and how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard, and how are they to hear without someone preaching? In 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the preaching of the cross is of them perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. One of the many examples I could share of this is of Chris Maynard, formerly the evangelist of the Little Dove Church of Christ in West Virginia, He's not there anymore because sadly they had to close the church down. They closed the church because like churches in West Virginia, it was just hanging off the side of a hill and it was right on the edge of a highway and, and the bell tower was, there was a gap between the bell tower and the main building, the bricks, about that wide and it was falling toward the, toward the road and then the rest of the church was getting ready to fall off the mountainside. So they had to close down. But during the 2020 COVID-19 scare, like many others, Chris took his preaching to the internet. One day, he received word from a nurse who attended his congregation that they had baptized an 89-year-old man the night before at the hospital after he heard Chris preach the gospel on the internet. This nurse had gone in and said, would you like to hear my preacher? And they took this 89-year-old man and baptized him at the hospital, and the next evening, that new believer in Christ entered into glory. But Chris talked to them on his program on the internet about accepting Christ, just like your preacher did here this morning. I like that. Another occasion while teaching the Bible, a Bible lesson, Chris was over in Pikeville, Kentucky, where he lived. What had happened was the church needed a preacher and Chris was a deacon. I was there holding revival at the Zebulon Church of Christ there and and I heard him talking to about the need, and Chris said, well, I'll go do that. And for several years, he went over and did it. So he was living in Pikeville, and he was teaching a Bible lesson. And when he finished, he said, are there any questions? Nobody had a question, so he hit the button to close it down. And just as he did, words came up, I have a question. And he hit the button, and he said, oh, no. And he got back on, and he was able to find the guy. And the guy wanted to make Jesus Christ his Lord. And that guy lived over in West Virginia. Chris spoke with him that night, and they met at the Hardy Church of Christ on the state line that night, because Hardy keeps their baptistry full all the time. I've had a lot of revivals there, and he baptized him there. Now, all of this from a church with an average attendance of less than 15 people. Preach with expectation that God's Word will always affect a change in the lives of the hearers. I've had so many times through the years I've had preachers say, well, I know my people. I, don't, I just don't give an invitation every week. I know them. And I said, well, you don't know them because they don't know what's going on in your heart. You don't know what's going on in their heart. And if you don't give an invitation, do you really believe what you're preaching? Because the Word of God changes lives. Let's invite people. They may not come forward for two or three years, but they are making decisions as we sing that hymn of invitation. And let me tell you, in our preacher boy camp, they are taught to give an invitation. Every one of them did the night that they preached, because we have to believe that God's Word is going to do its work. When you share your faith also with your friends and family, Christians, you're not just doing your duty. You're sharing life-giving manna 
from the mantle of God's Word. Expect that seeds planted will sprout in your life. Maybe not at this very moment you're sharing, or maybe so, or it might be some years down the line. But you share your faith, and you believe that the seeds are planted and that God will bring about change. Just as Elisha struck the water with Elijah's mantle and saw the waters of the Jordan separate, you strike sin with the mantle of God. Sin separate from the sinner. Two Moravian wit missionaries in their 20s some years back decided to pick up the mantle one day. They'd heard of an island in the West Indies where an atheist British owner had two to 3,000 slaves. The owner had said, no preacher, no clergyman will ever stay on this island. Won't be allowed. If there's one shipwrecked, we'll keep him in a separate house until he can leave, but he's never going to talk to any of us about God. None of my slaves, not me. I'm through with all that nonsense. 3,000 slaves from the jungles of Africa brought to an island in the Atlantic and there to live and die without ever hearing the message of Jesus Christ. These two young men in their 20s heard about it. You know what they did? They said, we better pray about that. Hope God will do something about it. No. They sold themselves to the British planter. They used the money they received from the cell to pay their own passage to his island. And as the ship was leaving its pier at the river at Hamburg, going out in the North Sea, carried by the tide, tide, Moravians had come from all over the area to see these two young boys off, knowing that they were never going to return. These 20-year-old boys, they had sold themselves into slavery for a lifetime, for a lifetime of slavery. This wasn't a short-term mission trip. This wasn't a four-year mission uh, uh, station to go to. No, a lifetime of slavery, simply that as slaves, they could witness to those who would never hear of Jesus otherwise. The families were there, weeping, for they knew that they would never see these boys again. Many wondered why they were going and questioned the wisdom of it. And as those boys saw the widening gap between themselves and everyone and everything they had ever known and ever loved, they linked arms, and one of them raised his hand and shouted to those who remained the last words they ever heard from him. May the lamb that was slain Received the reward of his suffering. And that was the last they ever heard from him. And that became the call of Moravian missions. These boys served, committed to their cause, passionate about their religion, and expectant for us. The mantle Elisha picked up was a cloth covering, a, a cloak. The mantle I'm calling you to pick up tonight is the Word of God, church. Pick it up, young and old alike. Don't try to maintain your church by maintaining your traditions. Don't try to grow your church by growing crowds with spectacular shows and programs. Quit trying to win your friends and families and neighbors with trite Christian slogans and hypocritical witness. Remember this, God's Word only will make Christians only, period. Can we say that again? Can we say it together? God's Word only will make Christians only, period. As Elisha picked up the mantle of Elijah, you must pick up the mantle of God's Word and do not compromise. Pick up the mantle and expose sin in the world and in the church. Pick up the mantle and raise the standard of holiness in your life, in your community, and in this church as well. And if you are an alien sinner outside of Christ, I bet you wait no longer. Pick up the mantle of God's Word and do what it says. Not tomorrow. Not tomorrow. Not the next day. Now is the day of salvation, the Scriptures tell us. Do it now. Confess Jesus as the Son of God and your Savior as Romans 10, 9 and 10 tells us. Repent of your sinful, rebellious life because without repentance, you are going to perish. The Word of God tells us that plainly. Confess Jesus, repent, be immersed in the watery grave of baptism into Jesus Christ.
for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the indwelling Holy Spirit raised up to walk in a new life. And then use the mantle of God's Word, your Bible, to part the waters and lead you on your way to a lifetime of discipleship and servanthood. Rise up, O church of God, have done with lesser things. Give heart and mind and soul and strength to serve the King of kings. This is your call. Pick up the mantle tonight. Do something about what it says. Don't wait. Don't just be a spectator. Do something about it. Rise up, O church of God. Let's sing it. Let's think about it. Brother Mike will be up here to greet you as you come tonight. We stand together and sing. Make your decision for Christ. Before we sing the third verse, would you bow your heads with me? I'd like to lead you in a word of prayer. We have a couple more verses, but maybe you're thinking, boy, I need to do something. And you're just a little bit shy. And I know that in a small town among your friends, it's kind of hard to do. But you know, doing the right thing isn't always easy. If God has spoken to your heart, let him talk to your feet now. You know what you need to do. Don't wait for somebody else to do it. Come and do that. Father in heaven, help us. We are weak in our own flesh. We need your strength to rise up and do what's right, to pick up the mantle and do what it says. And we thank you for giving us the strength now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 3. Hey, look, it worked. Wow, that's one of the hardest, I'm loud, it's one of the hardest things uh, for us to do when we find that call is to be the second fiddle. Um, I, I served with a lady one time that we were talking about serving and how great an opportunity is. She says, well, all I do is hold a door. It's a wrong mindset. All you do is hold a door. No, you hold a door. You're the first person that everybody sees walking in that door. You have no idea the impact you may have on that single mother who's struggling to get her kids inside and you greet her with a smile. We're glad to see you. Hey, can I help you? Or someone who just lost a loved one and you're that first smiling face they've seen since it happened. There's no such place in the kingdom of God as just holding a door. Every position is an opportunity to shine God's light into whatever uh, situation it is. So whatever it is that God's calling you to, I want you to know you're not just holding a door, you're getting to hold the door. Every opportunity uh, is just a wonderful example of God's grace pulling all of us into his plan to rescue and raise up the next generation. So I want to encourage you, whatever it is, hold your door and hold your door well. Lift high the cross of Christ and make the decision that you need to make as we sing this final verse. Yeah.